Welcome to the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introductions to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video is Chapter 9, The Transport Layer. The material in this video covers the 6.0 version of the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks course. I want to thank you for watching my videos. Your time is appreciated. And if you find the material helpful, you can subscribe to my channel. And remember to click the notification button if you want to see when I post new content. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment below. And if you want to watch to the end of the video, I'll have links to the next chapter. Okay, so let's talk about uh, chapter nine, the transport layer. And then we're going to talk about th uh, two different things in this, uh, in this uh, presentation or in this video. We're going to talk about transport layer protocols. Uh, we're going to talk about TCP and UDP. We're going to talk about uh, in-depth TCP and UDP. What are the differences between those? Uh, we're going to compare and contrast those. So that's what's going to be covered in this. And let's move forward uh, with the first segment here, transport layer protocols. So what is the role of the transport layer um, in the OSI? So the transport layer is responsible for establishing a temporary communication session between two applications and delivering data between them. So think about the transport layer is saying, I'm going to uh, establish a temporary communication, so I'm going to ring a phone on the other end, and we're gonna, I'm going to use a phone in this case. So I'm going to dial a number. The phone's going to ring on the other end. Somebody's going to pick up, and I'm going to say, hey, I need to, get, I need to get a connection with you. Someone on the other, uh, someone on the other end is going to say, oh, yeah, we're, we've got a connection going, and, so, uh, and here's my information, and let's start talking. So it pro also provides connection-oriented and you need, to, you need to make sure you get this connection-oriented data stream support, reliability, flow control, and multiplexing. And we're going we're gonna to talk about those here in a minute. So the transport layer, layer responsibilities, what is it responsible for? It tracks individual conversations. It segments the data, and it reassembles segments, and it identifies the applications as well. So let's uh, – there we go. And all right, so conversation multiplexing. What does it do here? Segments it segments data into small chunks of information so that it uh, carries across the network easier. Uh, it doesn't, you know, if you lose a packet, then it's a smaller chunk. So it, it and plus it doesn't take up as much bandwidth at the same time. So it also labels data chunks according to the conversation so that they can be reestablished on the other end in order. The transport layer reliability, it, uh, two protocols are provided, TCP and UDP, and we're going to talk more about that in this presentation here. But TCP supports reliability while UDP doesn't, and we're going to talk about those – like I said, we're going to talk about those two. But what you do need to understand is that TCP is reliable, it's connection-oriented, and UDP is not reliable, and it's not connection-oriented. So if nothing else from this slide right here, you need to make sure that you understand the differences between TCP and UDP. Now, TCP supports packet delivery confirmation. Uh, there's three basic operations that enable reliability with TCP. You have numbering and tracking of the data segments transmitted. Uh, to a specific host for a specific application, uh, acknowledging the received data, and retransmitting any unacknowledged data after a certain period of time. And I apologize, I should have had that information up here on this line here. Uh, but think about TCP. If you've ever sent someone a letter in the mail, or if let's just say that you've ordered something online, you've ordered a package from a uh, from a from a, and I'm not going to use the name of the person because I'm not going to plug any particular companies. But let's just say that you've ordered something online, and they ship your package, and you get a confirmation in in your email saying, "Hey, your package has been sent, and we're sending it to your way to you." You get the package, and then you find out that when that package gets delivered to your house that you have to sign for it. And so you have to send a signature back, and you have to say, okay, hey, I received my package, and, and I did get it, get it. Well, that's what TCP does. It sends a packet of information, and on the other end has to acknowledge that that packet was received. So it's reliable delivery confirmation. It's connection-oriented, and you're going to hear that term, connection-oriented, and you need to make sure that that's tied to TCP. That's what TCP provides you. UDP, on the other hand, 
provides basic functions for delivering data between appropriate applications with very little overhead and data checking. Perfect for applications that don't require reliability. It's kind of, if you've ever seen the Honey Badger video, it just don't care. UDP sends the information down the line and it's just like, I don't care what happens with this, I'm just gonna send it. And you have seen examples of UDP before whenever you've tried to get onto a web browser and you've tried to go to a website and part of the website loads but not all of it does. Well, that's UDP in action. It's just sending what it can. If it can't get it all to you, it really doesn't care. And your browser on your end doesn't care because it's, or your application on your end uh, doesn't care because it's just gonna say, I'm gonna receive whatever I can and that's all you're gonna get. And I'm not gonna acknowledge anything. Uh, I don't know anything's coming to me and I don't know if anything's gonna be sent back because it's UDP. And UDP and TCP serve two different roles and there's a reason for those and we're gonna talk about that in a second too. Um, but we also look at the right transport layer protocol for the right application. So TCP is better for databases, web browsers, email clients, and etc. So let's just say that you are um, you're sending a, uh, you, you have to send a form of information across a web browser. And so that information has to get there. And so you, when you type in information, it has to be acknowledged and it has to be received. TCP is going to kick in at that point and it's going to use the TCP protocol. So database information, let's just say that you're entering information into a database. That information needs to be received and it needs to be acknowledged because otherwise you get a response back and says, hey, by the way, we didn't get that last response from you and we need to, we need to resend it. Uh, email clients, for example, if I send an email, email to someone. That email, uh, you don't want to get partial email, partial information on there. So that email has got to be sent. It's got to be acknowledged uh, back that the email went through and all of the information went through. So UDP though, on the other hand, is better for live audio and video streaming. Let's just say that you're going to do a, a live stream on YouTube or Twitch or something like that. Um, and, and part of the, it kind of glitches a little bit. I was watching a um, watching Hulu the other day uh, on my laptop, and part of the video kind of glitched on me. Um, it, it just kind of, the frames jumped because my uh, bandwidth dropped a little bit. Well, that was UDP in action because it just streams that information to you, and if it loses some packets, it's okay um, because it doesn't really send, or it doesn't send, um, um, when it sends the information, it doesn't give an acknowledgement back. And the reason it does that is because it takes less bandwidth. TCP takes more bandwidth because of all the acknowledgements. UDP does not. So voice over IP, for example, if you're talking with somebody over a digital network um, and, and they, they get cut off for a few seconds or you lose a little bit of their voice, it's okay because you can say, hey, just repeat that last. And the reason you use UDP is because it takes less bandwidth, is less overhead. So it, it's cheaper. Uh, in the long run, and that's that's the reason, and 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 so the programs are going to pick the right one, right protocol for the right application. Now, when we look at TCP, we're going to look at an over overview here. Um, I would say you don't need to really memorize these. Um, uh, you don't need to memorize this frame of information here, but I would be familiar with it because you may get a question that says, you know, okay, in this area here, you know, what's the acknowledgement number, uh, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the sequence number and, you know, source port, destination port, where do those go? Um, in this course, I don't think you need to memorize these, but if you move forward on into the CCNA uh, material and on, and on forth and start working with um, uh, networking, you're going to need to uh, probably know these a little bit better. But you've got this TCP here. It establishes a session. It has reliable delivery, same order delivery. In other words, it's going to deliver everything in the same way it was sent. So it's going to break the packet up, one, two, three, four, five. And when it gets on the other end, it's going to reassemble it as one, two, three, four, five. It also has flow control. The header here, this is the header here, it is a stateful protocol. And by stateful protocol, I mean it's connection oriented. Uh, it adds 20 bytes of overhead in the segment header. So that that you you may not think you may think to yourself, well, that's only 20 bytes of information. Who cares about that? Well, if you start thinking about every header, every frame that gets sent, and 20 bytes of data get added to everything that gets sent on that internet or on your net or internet, 20 bytes of data get sent on your network, that does a eventually create a bigger overhead. So it does create more data that's going through. So it's 20 more bytes than, than are going through on a UDP uh, protocol. So again, um, you use UDP, but there is a cost to it. Uh, it does provide reliability, but there is a cost. Now on UDP, it's simple and fast. It's, it's streamlined, it's fast. It's a stateless protocol, and you do need to make sure that you understand and memorize TCP is stateful, 
UDP is stateless. So I just kind of think of – I just always think of UDP as uh, the honey badger. It just don't care. That's how I always know it. It, it. The reliability must be handled by the application. So the application handles the, oh, well, hey, I need some of that information back, and I'm gonna need, I need to re-request that. The pieces of communication in UDP are called datagrams, and UDP adds only eight bytes on the overhead. So you have eight versus the 20 with TCP. So again, the reason we use UDP is because it's simple and fast, less overhead. Now, when we send multiple separate conversations, the transport layer separates uh, – I apologize for the misspell where there – separates and manages uh, multiple communications with different transport requirements. So different applications are sending and receiving data over the network simultaneously. So they're all UDP packets, TCP packets. They're all going. Well, TCP has state full or it's, it's, uh, uh, it's state – or it's connection oriented. I always say connection oriented. It's e easier for me to remember. Unique header values allow TCP and UDP to manage these multiple and simultaneous conversations by identifying the applications. So the unique identifiers are the port numbers. So the port numbers let them let you know which uh, which application is being used. So for example, POP3 is you know 110. HTTP is port 80. HTTPS is 443. Um, you know IM is 531, and so forth. And so you have your ports, and that's how it identifies if it's going to be TCP or UDP. So the port numbers are usually seen in pairs. That's the source port and the destination port. And the source port is dynamically chosen by the sender. It's always going to be dynamic, so it gets sent, and it's it's based. And we're not going to get into it in this presentation here on how it's how it's chosen. If you want to study how um, the ports and port numbers get chosen, that, that's way more in depth than what this course covers. But just know that it's uh, chosen dynamically. The destination port is used, um, or is used to identify an application on the server. So the destination port has to be known. So, for example, if we're going to an HTTP, it's got to be going to port 80. But the sender, the source port, dynamically creates uh, the information and sends that on. And then so when that gets to the receiver, uh, then it knows that information and knows how to send it back. Now, when we talk about socket pairs, the combination of the IP address and source port number or the destination IP address and the destination port number is known as a socket. So when you hear the term socket, you know, we're not talking about going out and getting some tools and you know put, putting putting nuts and bolts on. We're talking about the IP and source port, IP address and source port, or the IP and destination port together is known as a socket. And the socket is used to identify the server and the service being requested by the client. Two sockets combine to form what we call a socket pair. So this is what you'll see as a socket pair here: an IPv4. That's your IP address. That's your that's your port your IP address, and that's your port. So this is coming from the source. That's going to the destination, so it's going to port 80. It's going to an HTTP. And sockets enable multiple processes running on a client and multiple connections to a server process to be distinguished from each other. So this information here distinguishes uh, because that, that, that IP address is unique to the uh, sender or to the requesting um, the client, let's say the client. And so that is allows us to have unique conversations, that, that socket pair. So make sure you understand why we have socket pairs. It's so that we can have unique conversations. And it says it says here, so the server process to be distinguished, but basically you're saying it's unique. Now the port number groups, who establishes these and who's you know who came up with all these port numbers? Well, it was the IANA has created three port number groups. So we have three port number groups. We have well, what we call well-known ports, 0 to 1023. I would recommend looking the well-known ports up, and you can just search on the Internet for well-known ports. And what you want to do is you want to memorize a group of those. You're going to need those. If you take the CompTIA Network Plus, you're going to need to know some of the well-known ports. You're going to need to know port 80, uh, and, you know, HTTP. HTTPS is 443. Uh, you're going to need to know POP3. You're going to need to know the mail clients, you know, IMAP. You're going to need to know those. And so those fall into the well-known port range. I would look those up. I would write those down. I would handwrite however you make notes about those to memorize the well-known ports. And when you start studying the Network Plus material, uh, some of the some of the study guides and things like that, they're going to tell you what are the well-known ports of which ones you need to learn. And also for the CCNA exam, you're going to need to know well-known ports as well. So it's it's on the material. You need to memorize it. Or you need to memorize the most of the well-known ports. I wouldn't say you need to memorize all 1,023. You're not going to need to know all of those because some of them aren't even used anymore. But you are going to need to know the most used out of the well-known ports. 
Then we have another range called registered ports. Those are given to um, – um, those are given to, for example, like here, the port – you know, um, let's say let's say Microsoft might have a few ports that they have on there or particular types of services that you have uh, on registered ports. Um, so if you have a particular type of service or something like that that you're setting up, uh, those get registered, and those are registered with the IANA. And then you have private and or dynamic ports. And when we were talking about earlier that the client creates a dynamic port, that's what this range is right here. The client between the 49152 and 65535 creates a dynamic uh, port based upon the – it's a combination of – well, it, well. Again, I'm not going to go into I'm not going to get into the details of it because it's way beyond the scope of what you need to know here. Just know that there's three port group numbers, and the uh, private and our dynamic are the ones that are created for those socket pairs that we were talking about. Now, with the netstat command, the netstat command on a Windows machine is very useful for being able to see active connections in a host. And this is an example of a netstat over here. So netstat will let you see what. Uh, protocols are currently open or what sockets are currently opened at the time. And it will give you your, your local address, your local port, and then it will give you your foreign address, the IP and uh, what's open over here. So you can kind of see um, sometimes you can kind of see, okay, what what's what's taking up all my network um, uh, communication right now? And you can look at that and um, it'll give you that. So Netstat also displays the process using the connection. So it just it gives you some really good information, useful information. Um, for your computer. All right. Well, 9.2 TCP and UDP. We're going to come back to TCP and UDP. The TCP server processes, each application process running on a server uses a port number. So every application process uses its own port number. An individual server cannot have two services assigned to the same port number within the same transport layer service. So you can't have two web servers running on the same server um, but with the same port numbers. So you're going to have to, uh, you know, th there's there's things that you can do um, to fix that. But um, for example, this server here has got port 80 and it's going to have an IP address with port 80, which creating that. So an active server application assigned to a specific port is considered to be open. So open ports. So in other words, you can see those on the network. An open port means that you can see it. Uh, you can ping you can ping that or you can use a Wireshark or you can use some kind of a wire sniffing tool to be able to see those open ports. You, you can probe. Um, I can probe this server and say, okay, I've, I see a port 80 open on there. So at any incoming client request address to an open port is accepted and processed by the server application bound to that port. So the, the server sitting here saying, hey, I'm open for business. And if I get a client request to the TCP server uh, or the HTTP server, uh, it, it, I, I'm going to I'm going to process that request. Uh, and that's another reason from a security standpoint, you want to close ports that you're not using uh, because you don't want to leave open ports that, that, that don't need to be opened. So there can be many ports open simultaneously on a server for one uh, for each active server application. So if you've got a, a web server and a print server uh, open on a server, you're going to have ports open for each of in those individuals. But you want to close ports down, and that gets more into the security side, but you do want to close ports down that aren't being used. I just always bring it back to security because it's such a big focus. Now, when we talk about the TCP communication process, we said that TCP is a connection-oriented, or it does make sure that there's a connection. Well, it has to establish that connection, and I talked a few minutes ago about making that phone call. Well, we talk about the handshake process, um, and what happens is a TCP connection is established in three steps. The initiating client request uh, a client to server communication session with the server. So it sends a, sends a send packet, S-Y-N. Um, it gets a send and an acknowledgement packet back. So the, the initiator says, hey, I need to open up a connection, and it sends it over here. The listener says, oh, okay, yeah, I, I'm open for business, and I'm going to send – I'm going to take your packet information. I'm going to add my acknowledgement to it, and I'm going to send it back to you. So the initiator says, hey, great. I, you know, I'm going to be able to communicate. So I'm going to acknowledge back to you that I received your acknowledgement. So I acknowledged that you acknowledged me. And so NIND data packets can be exchanged, and so the information can start flowing through back and forth. So the initiating client acknowledges the server-to-client communication, and you're in business. Everything's open. You can start communicating. Now, the termination works the same way. Uh, you get uh, – except you use a little bit different flag. This time you're going to use a fin flag or a finished TCP flag. It's used to terminate a TCP connection. So the initiator says, hey, I'm done communicating. 
I'm going to send it. I'm going to send us S Y N fin. Uh, it's going to acknowledge that it's closing. And then the initiator says, Oh, okay, great. I acknowledge that you acknowledge that we're closing the conversation. So then the data packets that were exchanged get, get stopped. So the client sends an acknowledgement to acknowledge the fin from the server. And when all segments have been acknowledged, the session is closed. That's a key. All the segments have to go through. Otherwise, you don't get a full uh, – it's connection-oriented, remember. And so if all the segments don't go through, you get errors, and not all of your information comes through, and you have to reestablish a connection and resend it. That's – if you've ever tried to send a file to a server um, or you know, and it says file didn't go through, or you've tried to upload something to YouTube, or you've tried to upload something to a server and it says, hey, it didn't go through, something happened. Well, that's usually what's happened is all the segments didn't go through. And so you didn't get all of the acknowledgments back saying everything worked, and so then you get an error. And it errors out. So when we analyze the three-way handshake, um, it, is, it establishes the destination device is present on the network. It verifies that the de destination device has an active service and is accepting request on the correct port and that the initiating client is requesting. So, uh, for example, port 80. Is port 80 open? Then the server says, yes, port 80 is open. And then the client says, okay, that's great. Here, I'm acknowledging that you're open, and here's my information. So it informs the destination device that the source client intends to establish a communication session on that port number. And then once it's established, it starts going through. I, I know I'm talking more that you probably think to yourself, man, that, that's such a simple process. Why are we spending so much time on it? Well, you need to understand why it works and, 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 uh, and how it works. So it works because that then establishes the TCP reliability and order delivery. So after we establish our uh, handshake or we establish our connection, the TCP segments use sequence numbers to uniquely identify and acknowledge each segment. So that's where our overhead comes from. You want to keep, it keeps track of segment order and indicates how to reassemble and reorder the received segment. So it sends the packets in one, two, three, four, five, six. It may not receive those in order. It may not receive them in order, so it may get one, two, six, five, four, three. So it may receive them out of order because, remember, it, it might have went on a different router. It might have. We don't know. But on the other end, TCP says, hey, we need to shuffle these cards back. These cards – we sent these cards, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now they're out of order, but we need to put them back in order before we pass this back up to the application. So the initial sequence number, or ISN, is randomly chosen during the TCP session. The ISN is then incremented by the number of transmitted bytes, and it's, it's, it transmits it and says, okay, here's how it's divided up. And so the receiving TCP process buffers process buffers the segment data until all the data is received and reassembled. So it takes all this information, it gets it, and it doesn't pass it back up until it gets it all because it has a header here that says, hey, here's the segments one through six should be coming to you. Well, I get one, two, three, six. Wait a minute, where's five, four, and three? Well, then five comes through, four comes through, then three comes through, and then it says, oh, okay, I've got them all. Let's let's package this up and send this on up to send this on up the OSI uh, route. So the data is delivered to the application layer only when it's been completely received and reassembled. That's important to remember with TCP, that it's, it's ordered. It may not re get received in the exact order, but TCP reorders it to make sure it's in the proper, uh, proper uh, format uh, so that all the data is there, and so it knows all the data is there. Now, flow control and window size, uh, TCP provides mechanisms for flow control. Flow control ensures that the TCP endpoints can receive and process data reliably. In other words, is there enough bandwidth or is it things dropping off? And am I, am I, dropping, am I dropping packets? Am I dropping uh, ones and zeros? If not, that's what the flow control allows. So it, it, you can adjust the size based on let's send smaller bytes of information. So TCP handles flow control by adjusting the rate of data flow between the source and the destination for a given session. So TCP, and that's another word saying, hey, I'm, if you've ever played video games online and you've gotten lag, that's what's happening sometimes. It, and that's not TCP, by the way, uh, because T, T, well, yeah, they may be using TCP, but when you get lag, what happens is you've got buffered information and it says, okay, now I've got this information. And yeah, in fact, it probably is using TCP for video games, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's lagging because it's having to buffer that information and it's having to do flow control. So somebody on the client side is not, not getting and receiving information as fast as the server and everybody else. So TCP flow control function relies on a 16-bit TCP header field called the window size. And you're gonna you need to you need to understand what window size is because you may see a question on that on the exams. Window size is the number of bytes that the destination device of a TCP session can accept and process at one time. 
That's important. Make sure that you understand that. So the TCP source and destination agree on the initial window size when the TCP session is established, and the endpoints can adjust the window size during a session if necessary. So in other words, if you start dropping off on bandwidth, it, it will adjust the window size for you dynamically as it works. You don't have to do anything. It's just it, it, gets, it gets worked out by the protocol. So now TCP flow control, uh, congestion avoidance. Let's say that there's, let's say that there is uh, traffic uh, on the interstate and you can't get through as well. So network congestion usually results in discarded packets. In other words, you might, you might get lag on a video game. Um, it, you know, might happen, but you start getting discarded packets, or let's say that all your email didn't come through. Um, uh, and so the undelivered TCP segments trigger retransmission. So it's got to retransmit it, which again takes more bandwidth. So TCP segment tra retransmission can make the congestion even worse because then it's saying, hey, I got to send this again because I didn't get it. And then it just starts backing up because you get more and more data on the network. So the source can estimate a certain level of network congestion by looking at the rate at which TCP segments are being sent, but not acknowledged. And then so then it can adjust the window size and it can adjust everything for it. So it can say, okay, we got to adjust this because we're, we're losing packets up here. So one came through, two and three didn't, and four did, but we've got a problem here. So we need to acknowledge segment one and segment two, uh, and we get the TCP segment two and three coming through. And then then three and four gets reset, or two and three gets reset because we didn't acknowledge uh, one and two, or two didn't get acknowledged because we acknowledged segment one. Uh, we didn't get two. And so if you get the acknowledgement for segment two saying, hey, you know, did two go through? No, two didn't go through, so we got to resend it. So acknowledgement numbers are for the next expected byte and not for a segment. So segment numbers are only used for simplicity. So it's just a, that's acknowledgement of that segment. Did it go through or not? And so if it didn't, then it has to retransmit. So TCP flow control and, and congestion avoidance continuing here. The source can reduce the number of bytes it sends before receiving an acknowledgement. The source reduces the number of unacknowledged bytes it sends and not the window size, which is determined by the destination. That's key there. And then the destination is usually unaware of the network congestion and sees no need to suggest a new window size. Now, UDP communication, we're not going to spend as much time on UDP because it's simplified, but it has low overhead. It's reliable, or it's not reliable, but you have low overhead. So that's what you give up. You give up the low reliability for low overhead. So UDP has a much lower overhead. Uh, it's not connection-oriented. It does not offer sophisticated retransmission, sequencing, or flow control, any of that. Application running UDP can still be used reliably, but it must be implemented in the application layer. UDP is not inferior. Don't think that, oh, well, why would I ever use UDP? Well, it gives you low overhead. It gives you less bandwidth, and it's not inferior. It's, you know, if you're going to do streaming, that's what you're going to use, uh, you know, streaming a video, or if you're going to do voice over IP, because you don't need that reliability with voice over IP. You don't want something, information getting repeated over and over and over again. You just said, okay, I, I missed that last part, and it, in it for an example, in a phone conversation, you can just re-say what you needed to say. So UDP datagram reassembly, UDP simply reassembles the data in the order in which it was received. That's key. That's what you need to remember about UDP. It reassembles it in the order that it was received. It does not reorder it like TCP does. And so the UDP server processes it and request. So UDP-based server applications are also assigned well-known or registered port numbers. And requests received on a specific port are forwarded to the proper application based on the port number. So just think of it this way, that the application handles the reassembling of the data and uh, – and and the, and the order. So UDP just gets it and forwards it right on. Um, it, it just it just doesn't really care. It just sends it it just sends it on as it receives it. If it doesn't receive it, it don't care. So now the UDP client processes. The UDP client server communication is also initiated by a client application. Uh, it the client processes dynamically or the client process dynamically selects a port number and uses that as a source port. Uh, the destination port is usually the well-known or registered port number assigned to the server process, and the same source destination pair of ports is used in the header of all the datagrams used in the transaction. And then the data returning to the client from the server uses a flip source and destination port numbers in the datagram header. So it flips that information and then sends it back. 
But again, it's 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 kind of simple. So applications that use T, TCP, um, TCP handles all transport layer related tasks. This frees the application from having to manage any of those tasks. And applications can simply send the data stream to the transport layer and use the services of TCP. So the application doesn't have to take extra processing power for that. It lets uh, the, the server uh, or the TCP side take care of that. Applications that use UDP, live video, multimedia applications, they can tolerate data, some data loss but require little or no delay. So when you're doing a phone conversation, you don't want it to, your information to be buffered and delayed because then you're like, oh, what did you say? You know, and, and so you need real-time conversation. So examples include voice over IP, live streaming video. So a simple request and reply applications, um, DNS, DHCP, those are UDP. Applications that handle reliability themselves, unidirectional communications where flow control, error detection, acknowledgments, and error recovery is not required or can be handled by the application. So if it can be handled by the application, then you can let UDP to be the uh, uh, protocol. So examples of that are SN SNMP and TFTP. Okay, for Chapter 9, let's look at our summary here. We have looked at UDP and TCP and that those are common transport layer protocols. There are differences between those two. TCP does not pass any data to the network until it knows the destination is ready to receive it. UDP just forwards that data on. It doesn't care. TCP is connection-oriented, and UDP is connectionless. And the application developer decides the transport layer protocol that best meets the requirement for their application. All right, so that's been Chapter 9. I hope this was helpful. If it has, go ahead and give me a thumbs up down below. Leave comments. I love to hear from uh, anyone that's watching my videos, and I hope you have a great day.